Hello everyone, today we'll be looking at an electric vehicle motor I was able to get my hands on. The motor is from an old Mitsubishi iMeV. It can output up to 47 kilowatts and its rated output is 30 kilowatts. The maximum output is around 60 horsepower and is similar to that of a light automobile. The diameter of the motor is around 25 centimeters and it has a width of around 35 centimeters. Compared to an engine of similar horsepower, it's a lot more compact. As for the cooling system, it's cooled by water. This is the entrance and exit for the cooling water. The motor requires cooling for its losses, but it's very compact in size and it effectively releases heat using the cooling water just like a regular engine. The motor here is synchronous. We call it a synchronous motor. There are various types of synchronous motors, but this one applies a magnet on the rotator. These are called permanent magnet types. The shaft rotates smoothly even when twisted using manpower. The rotator and the shaft are merged together and the magnet is inside the rotator. I'll be talking about the rotator in detail later on in the video. I looked up the number of poles in the motor, but couldn't find any information on it, so I'll try looking for the poles by turning it on. This is an inverter that I made before. I can only feed it forward, so I'm not sure if I can turn it on, but let me try. Hopefully it turns on. The reason it's difficult to use a synchronous motor is because we need to understand which way the motor's rotator is always pointing. Basically, which way the magnet inside is pointing. By supplying voltage to the stator, we create a rotating magnetic field, but we need to make sure the magnet and the field are always pointing in the same direction. This is what's difficult. I've prepared the motor, so let's try rotating it. But I can't guarantee that it will work. By turning the variable resistor, we can change the frequency and voltage of the synchronous motor. Let's try turning it on. It worked. Yep, it turns all right. I didn't expect it to work, to be honest. The reason why it worked is probably because of its light load. In a regular electric vehicle, there'd be a gearbox connected to the axle of the car. But there's nothing connected right now, so it probably turned without any problems. We're using the oscilloscope on the right to measure the electric waveforms. It's also measuring the frequency, which is around 11.1 Hz. The rotational speed of the motor is around 167.7 rotations. The current frequency was around 11.1 Hz, and the rotational speed was 167 rotations. This means that the number of motor poles comes out to 8 which is a lot more than expected. So what are motor poles in the first place? It refers to the number of poles the magnet inside the rotator holds, basically how many S and N poles there are. If a magnet had one N pole and one S pole, that's a total of two poles. As this specific electric motor has eight poles, there's a total of eight S and N poles. So there are four S poles here, and there are also four N poles here as well. This illustration shows a motor with eight motor poles, which is what we have with us here at this time. We were able to make the synchronous motor move, but if we augment it even a little, it stops rotating smoothly. The inverter is now directly outputting 30 volts, but let's try lowering it to around 20 volts. Let's try rotating the motor at 20 volts this time. Then, 
it starts shaking and stops rotating smoothly. This is what happens when a motor ruptures. The motor starts shaking aggressively and stops rotating smoothly. A rupture occurs when the electric field created by the stator doesn't match the rotator's rotational speed. Usually, the magnet pulled towards the electric field causes the synchronous motor to rotate. But if the electrical field rotates too fast, the magnet is only pulled for a moment, and then it's pushed away in the next moment. This causes the uneven, shaky movement. Let's try disassembling it to look at the inside. There's a lid on top and two caps at the bottom as well. Once we take these off, we can start disassembling. The top lid is easy to take off. Here we have the wires for the stator coils and the stator coils themselves. We just have the terminal for that. The caps on the back are sealed with bolts and are also easy to unseal. Got them off. There are many components that we can see inside. This is the resolver. It measures the position of the rotator. The resolver detects the position of the rotator and is a very important component. Most electric vehicles have a resolver. A resolver is required as they control the motors precisely. Turning the shaft turns this hexagonal component on the resolver with it. A resolver acts like a transformer. We can see the coils from the transformer here. Let's try to supply some voltage to the transformer, which thus displays the waveform. The first waveform on the oscilloscope shows the zeroth voltage, while the pink and blue waveforms are the secondary voltages. The resolver has three coils. Once we turn these shafts, the waveforms change like this. If we turn the rotator, the hexagonal piece turns with it. As the component is hexagonal, it also changes the magnetic resistances with it. This is the reason why the output waveforms change like this. So how does the secondary waveform help identify the position of the rotator? It's pretty simple. Let's shorten the time axis on the oscilloscope. If we turn the motor shaft, the output waveform of the resolver shows a phase 90 degrees off. There are high and low frequency components. The high frequency component comes from the voltage on the primary wiring, while the low frequency component comes from the rotating shaft. Let's separate the two components. We can identify the angle from the low frequency component. This is how the resolver works. Here we have the primary coil and here we have the secondary coil. The rotating component is the hexagonal component. As for the secondary coil, once the shaft rotates, the phase moves by 90 degrees. Let's look at how this works. We are first going to supply high frequency current to the primary coil. High frequency should be around 10 to 20 kilohertz. This causes the voltage to induce to the secondary coil. When the hexagonal component is close, the voltage inducement is large, while when it's far, the inducement is small. This is due to magnetic resistance. Once it rotates, high and low frequency components appear. 
The high frequency component is 20 kilohertz and the low frequency component is caused by the rotation. What happens to the voltage? Let's try drawing in the low frequency component's envelope curve. The voltage basically becomes a waveform which combines the low and high frequency components. The envelope curve is basically a trigonometric function. There's another coil on the secondary coil which will display a waveform similar to above but shifted 90 degrees. If this is a sine wave, then this would be a cosine wave. Sine here and cosine here. Let me delve further into the details. The first waveform is the high frequency component. The second waveform combines the low and high frequency components. It's basically what I did on the whiteboard. We want to identify the rotator's angle of rotation from these waveforms, but to do so, we want to look at the waveform which multiplies the two waveforms. The envelope curve, which used to look like this, by multiplying the two waveforms, now looks like a sine wave. Then, we want to overlay a random low-pass filter or a moving average filter to recreate the waveform without the high frequency component. There are two coils for the secondary coil. One is a waveform and the other shifted 90 degrees. We were able to identify the two waveforms. Once we have the two waveforms, we just apply inverse trigonometric functions to figure out the angle of rotation. All we have to do is solve theta equals tan A times 2, with A and B as inputs, to figure out the angle of rotation. We should get something like this. This is 0, then 2 pi radians, and negative 2 pi radians. And this is how we figure out the angle. We can also find the rotational speed from this. But the actual signal processing component is a bit more complex than this. To control the synchronous motor appropriately, we need the angle of rotation. So the circuit for the resolver's signal processing also has filter and compensation circuits. That's all for the resolver. Here, we have the control circuit from the Prius inverter we previously disassembled. There are two microcomputers on the circuit. Both are probably manufactured by Renasus. I searched the model of the microcomputers, and I believe these both have an RD converter which can convert the output signal from the resolver into digital angular data. There are two microcomputers. The first one is for the generator, while the second is for the motor. I'm going to disassemble this motor even further to look at the rotator and stators. The characteristics of these motors may change or deform once they're disassembled. So make sure not to reuse these motors. I was able to separate the rotator and the stator. This is the stator, and there is an insane amount of coils on the inside. We have the rotator here, made with iron and magnets. It uses a very powerful magnet, which attracts anything metallic nearby. It's very powerful. The rotator itself is very heavy. It weighs about 13.6 kilograms on its own. Well, it can output 47 kilowatts at 13.6 kilograms. That's pretty impressive. 
Let's take a close look at the rotator first. The lid right here can be taken off easily. This component holds the magnet. There's a hold in the steel sheets, which holds the cylindrical magnet. The rotator is manufactured by layering steel boards, which are punched through. These sheets are called electrical steel sheets and allow magnetic flux to pass through. The magnet is inserted like this, in between the layered sheets. As for the magnets inside the rotators, there are a total of eight pairs just like these two. These create the eight motor poles. I have an azimuth magnet right here. By putting the azimuth close by, we can identify the flux caused by the magnets. The magnets from the rotator and the electrical field caused by the stator attract each other, causing the rotator to rotate. Now let's take a look at the rotation time created by the stator. Here we have the Prius inverter again. I connected the three wires from the motor to the inverter. We'll output the layers of voltages from the inverter just as we did when rotating the motors and apply voltage to the stator. The motor usually has this rotator inside, but we've taken it out. Instead of the rotator, we'll be inserting this stick magnet which has a string attached to it inside of the stator. We'll raise the frequency of the inverter and check out how the rotating magnetic field is formed. Insert the stick magnet into the stator and increase the inverter's voltage and frequency. This will cause a rotation to occur. The magnet is attracted to the magnetic field causing it to rotate. To identify the position of the rotator, think about a situation without a resolver or without feedback control. On the rotating motor, try applying some external torque on the motor's shaft. This causes the motor to stop. This is because the external torque applied is stronger than the torque moving the rotator. This causes the motor to rupture. If we want to move the motor, even in a situation with external torque, we need to increase the voltage supplied. How to supply the voltage depends on the position of the rotator. This is where the resolver comes into play. By identifying the rotator using the resolver, we can supply the voltage which causes torque in the correct direction. Using a resolver to constantly identify the position of the rotator and supply the required current is essential for controlling the torque. Today we talked about electric vehicle Mitsubishi i motor. Thank you for watching the video.